We're coming up on Porsche. Wow, that looks beautiful. What are you going to do there? Ruin diving? Something like that. We get someone like you once in a while? Always seeking that adventure. Good to be young. Well, good luck to you. Thanks. Hey all there virtual crafters and farmers, thanks for clicking and welcome to a quick guide on the features of my time at Portia. Or is it Portia? You know, I'm not sure on that pronunciation, but this is a half car channel, so let's go with Portia for fun! Now, there's a slight amount of character customization options for players to browse through before getting started on this post-apocalyptic life sim endeavor that takes a little bit more lighthearted approach. But you can decide if this game fits in your niche, or perhaps you've already snagged it on one of those snazzy 75% off Steam sales and are just getting started on your adventure. Either way, hope you're having a fantastic day and that you're enjoying your gaming hours because games are awesome in my opinion. Plus, uh, they have some really amazing benefits to our health. I do get into some random social science stuff on the world and gaming on this channel, so if you're ever interested in getting into that topic, take a look at the playlist. But for now, we're about to get into this totally cheery, colorful virtual world of Portia, and we will be arriving by boat to this little landscape covered in gatherable resources. Not unlike many tranquil survival type games, we have a family member that's left us a farm or a workshop of some kind, and we mysteriously find ourselves headed to salvage the property and run it while supporting the economy of a small town. In that regard, my time at Portia isn't substantially different, but most notably the game leans on exploration and hunting for artifacts as a central focus, one which goes over the top of typical crafting survival sims. The NPC Presley will meet us first thing, and through his initial requests, we get the tutorial for how to build basic tools and machines. In order to get your town builder license, you must first gather items to make a proper axe and pickaxe to prove that you have some skills at least. After returning those, the next task walks us through using the assembly machines to create more complicated interactive options. The first and vital need is the stone furnace, but when flipping through the pages of the workbook your father left behind, you can see it's got further inventions it will process materials including a cutter saw and grill. Getting these creations crafted and functioning will now open up entirely new menus of craftable components. The town of Portia is pretty big on digging up the past, but have two different philosophies about what to do with all these data disks that you're going to dig up once they're on Earth. While the research center treats it like more just bits of information to understand the world we live in, there's a local religion-based group that sees them as a door to Armageddon and seeks to destroy any history that could remain on the disks. This sets us up for a story for a lot of potential conflict themes, perhaps even results in a choice of alliance between the ideologies, something that we might have to deal with at times in our real life. Now on to the crafting basics. The primary objective in this game is to assist the residents of Portia in rebuilding it into a proper city by constructing many infrastructure projects. Most of the blueprints for these projects will come by way of progressing through the quest lines, starting with the bridge pieces that connect us to an island not far from the city walls. Our level 1 workbench and assembly station are already provided and can be upgraded through the catalog located at a &G Construction next to City Hall. The workbench is loaded with tools and the components needed to assemble larger creations. It's here that you can craft up gathering utensils needed to collect materials. Then, there is this platform called an assembly station which allows us to combine up those components 
into industrial machines and infrastructure pieces requested by Mayor Gale. There is an instruction book already preloaded with blueprints left behind for us. This will keep expanding as you quest and visit the research center to unlock more inventions. Some examples of our available machines include a stone furnace for smelting ores into bars as well as creating bricks, glass, or charcoal. The grinder used to make component parts for larger inventions or items which fulfill commissions by townspeople, including ammunition crafting. The civil cutter, which is a basic table saw used to make wood from gathering into planks and also uses for cutting slabs or marble or making metal plates. Then there's the basic skiver. This machine deals in textiles like cloth and leather, but also materials associated with crafting garments like thread. If you're looking for rope, uh, it's in here. As with many of these stations, there are going to be upgraded versions of these that ever increasingly expand on the list of materials that you can make with modernized versions. But we're gonna need a ton of gatherables to get all this done. So on to talking a little bit about where to find it all. Early on, you'll be informed about the ancient ruins located all over the area, two of which are nearby and can be explored for a weekly maintenance fee. This is where we get to be adventurous and play part researcher. You'll be given a jetpack and a scanner for your entrance fee, which will allow you to locate artifacts or other special items that are embedded in the cave's floors and walls. Per the instructions, put yourself into the relic scanner mode using the F key on PC, and you'll be able to mine, but look for these dimly glowing spots as they mark the direction for something shiny. Once the circle completes and locks onto the location, exit scatter mode and start slamming a pickaxe into it. Eventually you'll uncover whatever was there. You may be able to find spare parts, necessary fuel stone resources for your machines, and artifacts which can be reassembled through the research center in town once you've located all the necessary pieces. Among the yellow glowing spots will be a few pink ones. These mark tunnel entrances to the abandoned rooms, which act like mini-dungeons and may contain some nice loot. Inside can be a single or a few rooms with these little gooey guys that shoot poison. They're fairly easy to manage while looking around for treasure chests inside. As we're doing all of this, you also might notice the heavy load of sand, dirt, and ores picked up along the way all which can be useful in fulfilling a stream of commission requests from townspeople to gain currency in this game called Goals, as well as the increasing the rating of your workshop, which allows for increasingly lucrative commissions. These ancient ruins end up being a focal point of the game. You get to play archaeologist, aside from just using it for a typical mining of ore resources. There's a lot buried beneath these rocks, and it can be a steady income stream in addition to the relics, which can be pieced back together inside the research center. Also scattered around the main open area is trees, which provide not just stacks of wood, but can also be kicked repeatedly for drops like apples, honey, cocoons, and rubber, among other useful items. Rocks outside the ruins provide stone as well as rare gemstones, sulfate, and marble slabs needed for many industrial projects. The plants, which are scattered throughout the landscape, that are worth stopping to stock up on, as you'll never know what commissions will come from the residents. Anyone who has played games similar to this one pretty much already knows the drill, so let's get on to farming. You just need to look for the NPC Emily to provide you with a quest chain for the small planter boxes to get started on Porsche's rendition of virtual farming. The large planter boxes can be obtained from the church store for two data disks, while finding Emily around the big farm for a quest that will give you the recipe book to craft the smaller ones from the workbench. Putting down a planter with seeds during the correct season for the crop starts a timer on the plants. There's no manual watering needed here, However, there is fertilizer which will increase the amount of yield from the crops once fully grown, each variety according to its own timer length. Seeds can be found by picking up piles of random animal feces, but can also be purchased from Sophie's Farm Store out in the middle of the field. 
There are a handful of varieties, including apples and apricots, which are purchasable with data discs from the church store, which pops up around town during the day, but can always be found on the tower that tops the town. It's probably no surprise that among our gathering abilities is fishing. Crafting a pole is possible through the starter workbench as soon as we have some wood and cocoons that drop from kicking trees. Fishing doesn't work just anywhere, but there are a few designated spots marked along the water with a circling water animation. When standing near, a prompt will pop up to fish. Make sure that you have some worms on you found from harvesting plants and your line will be automatically cast out to the water. An exclamation point will appear when a fish is hooked. Now the fishing line can snap from too much tension. All you need to do is keep the mouse moving from side to side to stay hovered over the fish to prevent this. And as a side note, while you're fishing the daytimer will stay paused, but it does cost 6 stamina each time you cast. The basics of raising animals starts with upgrading our player housing through the A&G Construction Company near City Hall. Listings in the catalog among upgraded workbenches are also the Chicken Coop, Cow Shed, and Stable. Each requires a stack of currency of gulls and a small list of processed materials. The Chicken Coop holds not only just the chicks, but also ducks. To obtain these, you'll have to find Rancher McD, who's located out in the fields near the farm store. He also stocks sheep and cows that can be purchased once you have a shed. You'll find nearby the stable in which you can buy horses and also rent one for seven days at a time. And while animals kept on your farm won't die if you ignore them for days at a time, Making sure they're fed by adding appropriate foods to their housing storage will ensure a steady stream of daily drops including milk, eggs, and more. Don't forget to give some loves to your animals to help them level fully and grow faster. It also helps to build up happiness in horses that come with an additional stable menu for leveling skills to increase their stamina or speed as a mount. This can greatly increase your chance at winning races in one of My Time at Porsche's seasonable events. So. I'll just segue right into talking a little bit about those. In the player menu, aside from the usual inventory panel, the character UI, the quest log, there is also a calendar. Events and holidays are already marked as reminders and an icon will also appear for the Ruins Expired Timer. Seasonal events provide players with something to look forward to to break up the grind and also provide some bonus cosmetics or decorations for the house. The fishing competition happens early in the year, so save up some bait for the challenge to catch some gold generating fish. Then there is the Day of the Bright Sun, which is a free-for-all scatterfest where aircraft above shower citizens of Portia with gifts. Try to catch as many as you can, as there are occasionally some useful stuff in there. The martial arts tournament requires advanced sign-up to participate. Citizens gather and square off against each other in a fighter game style gameplay. If you want to sit it out, you can still make bets on your favorite characters. The Day of Memories is a bit of fun running around, blowing away ghostly figures with a little pop gun for prizes. Grab your mount and get ready for the land run later in the year. Pace yourself and collect edibles to come out the winner. Don't forget to check the vendor for neat decorative additions to your home. Put up your saved farm products for use during the Autumn Festival. Put up your best giant vegetable for competition and join in the collaborative potluck amongst residents. The Snowball Battle is a test of your tossing abilities. 
Residents from town will hide behind snow piles while periodically popping up, allowing you to throw a snowball in this variation of a whack-a-mole event. The winter solstice is another opportunity to show off your cooking skills, rounding off for a full year of fun with the citizens of Portia. I wanted to mention a rather large objective within the game. Like many of these titles, we can do quests and fill up our friendship meters. In my time of Portia, it isn't an afterthought, but really a feature, and more of a mainstay for the long-term goals as a player can date, marry, and eventually have children with NPC characters. There are several ways to generate reputation, which include finding them daily to talk, playing rock, paper, scissors, sparring off in mini fighting games, and gifting the items that they're fond of. Once you've picked up a target of affection and gained enough stars marked in your player menu, you'll be able to ask them out on dates, which can be a fun side quest that will have you traveling all over the map. In addition to the humans in town, there are also a couple of furry friends roaming around who will become permanent residents at your farm after building up a familiar status. Pinky the Cat is the easiest to adopt by simply raising reputations with gifts and chatting. Scraps the Pup will become available after a quest line that opens up in the collapsed wasteland. Schoolgirl Polly will inform you that Scraps is missing and have you ask around town about his whereabouts. Arlo informs you further about barking being heard from the wasteland. Take along some dog food, made in the blender with some meat and salt, then make your way through the collapsed wasteland gates. Follow the decaying tower off to the right of the wasteland entrance. If you look down over the cliffside, you'll see a pond of water collected at the base of the waterfall with a tipped over cabinet. Scraps is found nearby. If you give the furry pal uh, the dog some food that you packed with you and just wait for them to come back to town. After that, you'll find him wandering the streets every morning where you can perpetuate your relationship until the level of familiar. Once reaching that threshold, Scraps will make your farmhouse their permanent residence. Along with the farmable ruins, there are several structures dedicated to my time at Portia's version of a dungeon. The first you'll encounter is the collapsed wasteland zone called the sewage plant. In the menu, you'll be prompted for which level of the dungeon you want to engage and the approximate loot possible for completion. It consists of fighting through several floors of enemies, and all of this will eat up a lot of stamina, so be sure to take along adequate snacks if you're planning on going several rounds. Once the floor for each level is cleared, you'll square off with a boss in the final zone. There are two other dungeon locations, one in Euphala Desert, and it's called Ingle's Mine, as well as the Deepest Ruins located at one of the more endgame zones of Somber Marsh. My time at Portia combines many familiar elements and play styles of the farming crafting genre, quite a lot of them. I could see this possibly appealing to a wide audience that's looking for a simple, chill game but one with a lot to do before everything in it has all been run for its worth. It's good that players can pick up on this for PC, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and also on mobile platforms. So I think it's probably accessible for most. It can often be found on sale over on Steam and is a considerable value for the amount of hours that could be invested. It comes with mixed reviews from critics and I'd have to agree that some of their feedback about it being painfully slow in a few ways However, that's also coming from my perspective or that of the reviewers, and while it may be our preference, other players may have other preferences too. It's not like we can claim the game was designed objectively wrong, so it's really hard to say that it's any type of bad game over a preference because the title does well on other merits of incentivizing the play that keeps people returning to finish game tasks. I think it's only worthy of noting that for those who hate waiting or long-term planning, may not care for the pace of my time at Portia. I can already tell by how long I've sunk into the game that it's going to be a while before maxing out my workshop and farm, 
let alone getting the factory for mass production. Which is actually fine. I found enough was in the game to be motivated to finish it out, and it's possible that many players will find their niche incentives to play the game for hundreds of hours. There's plenty in this title worthy of praise. It's cute, charming, and it's a little game world with a large variety of ways to amuse oneself. I can equally understand that the routine wouldn't appeal to others who are looking for a constant stream of new experiences. While there are steady upgrades to work towards, it can take effort at grinding away a bit to get there. Since this is gaming that just might not be for how people want to spend their few precious hours that we get in modern life. For others, it's exactly what they were looking for in distraction that will last a good long while, and Porsche has a lot to offer these folks. Take care y'all, and bye bye